Good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about uh, two indicators of risk and performance for investing in the stock market. And before I start, we'll, uh, I'd like to say this material has been prepared for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide or to be relied upon for specific investment advice. Thank you. Well, let's go on. Beta and R squared. That's what we're going to talk about today. Two indicators. What is an indicator? Here I have a jet cockpit up on the screen and it's chock full of dials and called indicators. But what is an indicator when we're talking about investments? Indicators are numbers or calculations that provide information to help us make good investment decisions. They're statistics or calculations. They're numbers often. We can use a collection of our favorite indicators. We collect them together into an investment toolbox of sorts. It helps us navigate through the market just like the airplane pilot uses the indicators in his or her cockpit to help navigate the plane. Now we have three basic types of stock indicators. The first type is descriptive. Those are like the industry, the market capitalization, the dividend yield, the average volume traded. Those are descriptive stock indicators. The second type of stock indicator is uh, fundamental stock indicators. Those are like price to earnings ratio, sales growth, return on investment, debt to equity ratio. Those give you a look at the fundamental aspects of the business you're evaluating or the stock that's associated with the business you're evaluating. An under the hood look at a business like a CPA might look at it. And the third type, and in this category, we find beta and R squared that we'll be talking about today is the technical stock indicators. Like I said, beta and R squared, which I'll explain in a minute. We have the relative strength index and a variety of moving averages. You might have covered moving averages in one of your math classes. Um, but moving averages of price and volume. And then indicators developed from those moving averages. And there's a lot of those. But we're not going to talk about anything but beta and R squared today. Now those are stock indicators, but there's other indicators, that is numbers or statistics or calculations, that you might want to use to help in your investments. And those uh, are like market indicators would be one set that tell you which direction the market's going. And um, the other type are economic indicators, which indi tell you which way the economy is going. But today, we're going to give you an example of a stock, two indica stock indicators, uh, beta and R2, and those are technical stock indicators. So there's thousands and thousands of indicators, but today we're only going to talk about two. If you want to see examples of these indicators, probably the best place to go, I have found, is a site called finviz.com. That's F-I-N-V-I-Z dot com. Just check around, hit a few of those tabs, and you'll get a good look at the many dozens and dozens of indicators that are available to you. The first indicator that we're going to discuss today is beta beta and that's the Greek letter beta up there on the screen beta describes the activity of a securities returns when I use the word security today you can think of that as being a stock there's more types of securities than stocks but the activity of a securities returns um, how it responds to variations in the market how it responds relative to the market. So if the market goes up, beta tells you on average how much the security is going to go up or down. So it gives you an indication of performance and risk. 
and it's calculated using the covariance a mathematical term there of the securities returns and the markets returns but we're not going to talk about the covariance so much but we are going to get into a little bit of math in a few minutes and it's a calculation that investors use to determine whether a stock moves in the same direction of the market and how much how springy it is if the uh, how, if the market goes up how much does beta go up how much does the stock go up on average or down and usually you won't have to calculate beta we're going to show you how to calculate it today but usually you're not going to have to calculate this on your own you're going to use a stock screener like finbiz which i showed you previously or a stock screener that's associated with your investment account like um, Fidelity or Vanguard or whatever you're using for your own personal investments. They have fantastic stock screeners where you can query stocks by, based on all these indicators which I mentioned earlier. And one of those is beta. So you won't have to calculate this generally, but it's a very good idea for you to know exactly what it is so you can understand how to use it best and not how to miss use it. Let's take a look under the hood. How to calculate beta. So we're going to do this in four steps. Again, you don't normally have to calculate it, but today we're going to calculate some simple examples for you. The first of all you do is you log the performance of the security or the stock over time. And you also log the performance of the market over that same time period and then you plot those two things against each other in a scatter plot and then you find the slope of the best fit line that goes through those scatter plot points you know it's as if you take a ruler to those points and you we're going to show you an example in a minute and you get a you get a best fit you get a line that sort of exemplifies the pattern you see now we're going to there's a mathematical way to do this you don't actually do it with a ruler but I'm um, I'm just saying that for uh, as a as a teaching example okay so when perf when I'm talking about performance logging the performance I'm talking about um keeping track of the daily closing prices of the stock over some time period and then you calculate the gains and losses from day to day and of course the gain is uh, calculated by today's closing price minus yesterday's closing price divided by yesterday's closing price and you usually express that as a percentage and that's typically plus or minus less than one percent sometimes the market goes up and down more than one percent but you know it's it's on that uh, order of magnitude here's a function uh, the first of all to get the closing prices I guess you could go you could go look them up somewhere online and manually type them into a spreadsheet but that would be awful tedious I find that uh, spreadsheets like Google Docs or Microsoft Excel have financial functions built in and the one I like to use just for these simple type things is is Google Finance because I use Google Docs right so here's an example of a Google Finance function in a Google Docs spreadsheet using Apple stock as an example and you see the function there equal sign Google Finance and the very first argument is AAPL which is the ticker for Apple and then the second argument is price which is really the closing price and then the next two arguments are the start date and the end date and the, the last argument is daily which means you want the stock closing price for each day okay I invite you to try that out in your own Google Docs spreadsheet if you have a Gmail account if you have a Google account and if you don't I think maybe you should get one just for <coughs> creating little spreadsheets to help you here is an example of Apple um, the results you get when you use that Google Finance function now when you use that Google Finance function 
you really only get the first two columns here for the date range you get you specified you're going to get the first column is the date and time and you notice that 1600 hours that's the four o'clock closing time right and then the next column is the closing price in dollars the third column is something I calculated and that again is um, today's closing price minus yesterday's closing price divided by yesterday's closing price formatted as a percentage okay so normally here I only have a few days right I have what like six days up there but you're gonna to want to calculate beta over more than six days at least 20 uh, or 90 something like that okay. so that's the performance of the stock the next thing you're gonna do is calculate the performance of the market now how the heck you do that well one of the most common indicators or um, ways to characterize the market is to use what we call the S&P 500 stock market index the S&P 500 is a stock market index that measures the stock performance of 500 large companies that are listed on stock exchanges in the United States and most of us consider that to be one of the best representations of the US stock market and so that's what we're going to use as our standard and in my calculations here I'm going to use an electronically traded fund otherwise known as an ETF called the SPDR S&P 500 trust and the ticker for that is SPY SPY okay keep that in mind now so we use the Google finance function we we use it twice once for the like say your stock you're looking at like Apple and then once using spy and then we take those two columns of gains and losses and we plot them against each other in a scatter plot you can go this do this rather easily on Google Docs or Microsoft Excel and uh, how to do this would be a lesson for another day or another teacher but um, perhaps we'll come up with a sample spreadsheet for you to use but anyway you plot the two uh, here here's the market versus Apple now on the x-axis is the S&P 500 gains and losses which we use that spy ticker for and on the y-axis is the uh, Apple gains and losses okay and so we just there those are represented by data points on this plot okay and what do you see when you're looking at this uh, plot you see a pattern right you see a pattern sure you do basically you see the the, the dots go uh, left they slope up from left to right and we could actually we could actually take a ruler and put it in the middle of all the dots and here I have a line and I put a line in the middle of all those dots but instead of using a ruler which is not mathematical we're going to use a mathematical technique called linear regression you might have studied this in high school math or you might not have gotten to it yet maybe algebra 2 might be a good place to get that I'm not sure but anyway we're going to use mathematical it's called linear regression to get a line that fits the points in the best way possible that is it's a straight line that minimizes the sum of the squares of the vertical distances from each data point to the line now back to beta the indicator that we're discussing today beta is the slope that is the rise over the run of this best fit regression line so it's the slope of this line you see here that's beta and it's the line that minimizes the sums of the squares of those vertical errors or those vertical distances from each data point to the line and this is a mathematical formula it's very very easy for computers and spreadsheets but a bit more difficult for us to calculate by hand and here's what you do <clears throat> basically said so it's easy to do if you're going to use uh, Google Docs spreadsheet you'd use the slope function to calculate beta okay 
And the first argument in the slope function would be your y-axis, which is your Apple stock performance. And the second argument would be the um, performance of the market, which we use the SPY ticker for. Now, what is the slope of that line? Well, if you use that slope function, you'd find out that it was 1.29. So over the time range we considered, Apple stock has a beta of 1.29. That means that you may expect that Apple stock on average beats the market by 29% for gains and does worse than the market by 29% when the market goes down. See how it's a measure of risk? So it bounces 29% higher and 29% lower with market ups and downs. Now, you got to be careful because that's averages. That's statistical. On any given day, it might happen that Apple stock goes up but the market goes down or the market goes up and Apple stock goes down. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. So it might, it might go vice versa. But we're talking about averages. Here's another one. Uh, I'm using a ticker called SCHB, which is the uh, Dow Jones U.S. Broad Stock Market Index. And we see that the beta there, look at that. It's almost like a, it's a, almost like a straight line. The pattern is so, so good. And the slope is almost exactly 1, 0.99. This means that this matches the market almost exactly. So which brings up a good point. If this slope, if this beta is greater than 1, then the stock market, the stock is expected to beat the market on average. And if it's less than 1, it's expected to underperform the market. And if it's equal to 1, like this example here, it should match the market in performance. Getting the idea how you might want to use beta? Here's another example. What happens, though, when um, beta is negative? That's right. If you do this versus certain stocks or securities, you'll find a negative beta. The, the line slopes the other way. What the heck does that mean? Well, here's an example with gold. It's an electronically traded fund. Uh, the SPDR Gold Trust, ticker GLD. In it, at least over this time frame, operated opposite to the market, a negative slope, which means generally when the market went down, it went up. And when the market went up, it went down. Now we can sort of figure this one out it's because that people invest in gold, they start investing in gold when the market's poor, and then they buy more stock and sell their gold when the market is good. Okay. Now, what would you do with a negative beta? When would you want to use a negative beta stock? Maybe when the market's poor, right? Here's a better example of a negative beta. This one is an ETF that tracks something called VIX, V-I-X. That's the Chicago Board Options Exchange Volatility Index, which is a popular measure of the stock market's expectation of volatility. That means it's an indicator of investor confidence, fear, or uncertainty. I'll say it again. Indicator of investor confidence, fear, or uncertainty. So when the VIX is high, then uncertainty and fear is high among traders, and they're expected to pull money out of the stock market. And when VIX is low, that means confidence in the stock market is high, and money is expected to return to the stock market. So you can call this a fear index. The higher it is, the more fearful the investors are, and they're, gonna, they're expected to pull their money out. Okay? This is a negative beta of negative 1.84. Okay? Here's our last example, Soy. It's called Sun Opta Inc. Its beta is almost zero, right? What can you tell by that? Well, you can't tell much because the performance of Sun Opta Inc. doesn't seem to be correlated to the market at all. <laughs> this makes no sense. There's no pattern for us to recognize here. 
And that brings us to our second indicator that we'll be discussing today, which is R squared. R squared is called the coefficient of determination, and it's a statistical measure of how close the data points are to the regression line. So I showed you a lot of sh scatter points today, and some of them were more tightly were more tightly uh, spaced toward the line, and some of them were more scattered, right? Well, R squared sort of measures that. So these two indicators, beta and R squared, sort of go together. R squared sort of tells you how good or how reliable your beta is. Okay, so the two should be thought of as 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 a team working together. And in investing, R squared is interpreted as the percentage of a funds or securities or stocks movements that can be explained by the movements in the market. Okay, so R squared value for Sonopta is zero, which means that none of its price movements can be explained by the market. It's not correlated with the market. So our squared values normally range from 0 to 1 or are stated as percentages from 0 to 100%. So an R squared of 100% means that all movements of a security are completely explained by movements of the market. So in investing, a high R squared between 85 and 100% indicates the stock's performance moves in line with the market. And a fund with a low R squared indicates that the security does not generally follow the movements of the market. And so the higher the R squared value is, the closer it is to 1 or 100%, the more useful the beta is. And I'll show you some R squared values for some of the stocks we talked about today. 91% for that Dow Jones market index. 46% for Apple, so that means that uh, only 40%, 46% of Apple's performance can be attributed to the market. Gold was 27%, and soy was zero, as we've already discussed. How do you calculate R squared? Well, we use, in Google Docs, we use the Corel function. Okay, and the first argument is the range of the performance for the stock in hand and the second argument is the um, range of performance of the market index you're using in this case that's SPY for us okay officially the Corel function produces the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient we take this coefficient and we square it to get R squared Thank you so much for listening to my spiel. Good luck in using beta and R squared to inform your investment decisions. There's a hell of a lot more to learn, and thank you for being with me today.